What if I told you that every election is not the most important election of our lifetimes? It's counter to almost everything you hear candidates say cycle after cycle, and it's that's kind of rhetoric that increases the political anxiety of voters and residents throughout Pennsylvania and the United States. But what do we do with political anxiety? Is it legitimate? Is it overhyped? And how do we address it before it divides our communities, our friendships, and our families? Jeff Coleman is a former member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. He's author of the book, With All Due Respect, and he joins us to talk about those questions and more. That's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chen, and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm Sam Chen. Every election, you, every candidate says, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. In the last few years, they've been getting qualified, saying, I know you heard it last time, but this time it's real. But is it? Is every election really the most important election of our lifetime? And what happens if the, quote, wrong candidate wins? All of this has led to increasing anxiety among voters and even those not involved in politics every time the election comes around. So how do we address that anxiety? What do we do about it? And what do we do when it affects our friendships and our relationships and our families? Jeff Coleman is a former member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. He is a past candidate for lieutenant governor, author of the book, With All Due Respect, Recovering the Manners and Civility of Political Combat. Uh, he has been named to plenty of lists of the greatest political consultants in the state, and he joins us here tonight. Jeff, welcome back to Face the Issues. It's good to be back, Sam. Good to see you. It's good to see you. As always, uh, just such a joy to have you as part of this conversation. Uh, for our viewers who don't know, Jeff has, has been a, a mentor and role model of mine in my career in politics, and so it's always great to have him here. Uh, Jeff, let me just start with, with that 30,000-foot question. It, it's no secret. There, there needs to be no scientific study that shows that political anxiety is on the rise in the United States. I think every interview I do, uh, not, not in the host seat on other networks, I get asked, is everything going to be okay after this next election? It's, it's almost a, a universal question in interviews now. Why is there so much political anxiety? Well, look, when, when politicians say that every election is, uh, is the definitive one for your lifetime and that if you don't vote for me, the world will end, really, that's what people are saying. If, if you're especially these national campaigns, that if you do not elect me or select me for this position, everything you cared for, the American dream, you, or the way your, your right to worship, your right to walk the streets in peace, your safety, your comfort, the comfort of your children, and your children's children will be gone. I mean, that's really the level of rhetoric. And when you think about each of the presidential candidates this year spending at least $1 billion a piece to essentially say why the other person isn't the right person to be the president, that is creating a perpetual state of anxiety for people. I mean, the number of, of people that I've spoken to that says, my father was in hospice, my mother was dying, and the last thing they had on the TV was their favorite uh, cable news channel. Wow. And it wasn't, they weren't listening to song and scripture. You know, they were listening to, to a, uh, their own kind of soundtrack that confirmed that their blood pressure should be high and that there was nothing to live for. It's a really terrible way to live and it's a horrible way to die. Yeah. Yeah. I often say that it's a bad way to do politics. It's a bad way to govern. It's a worse way to live. And that's kind of where we are now. It's, we're not just yeah. talking about political people like you and me that look at this stuff. We're talking about people who, who aren't in politics. And I think sometimes they're affected or their anxiety is even more so than those of us who do this for a living. Can you get into why it seems that those who don't do politics uh, end up being more affected by this? Well, I think people that don't know how, to, how the sausage is made, and I think even within the political bubble, you never can really figure out what the other side is doing mm -hmm. until the end of a campaign when all the secrets are out and you see where people spent their money. But I think people outside think that the, there can't be this level of deceit in political campaigns. People can't lie or distort or manipulate all the time. So there must be a kernel of truth in what they're saying. The other thing, though, I think we self-deceive. 
sometimes, meaning we put our own filters on saying, I don't want to believe that truth, that fact, that information about the other person, because I'll be left with no choice to vote for. And I've already decided who I'm going to vote for. So new information I can't process. That's, I think, one of the challenges of being an outsider looking in on the political game. You want to be in on it, too. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Jeff, let me ask you this. It, it, this. Obviously, we know that the work that political consultants do, and it's not every consultant, but the works that these campaigns and these consultants do, it certainly drives up the anxiety. But did they yeah. create it? Or are there real issues that kind of underlie these anxieties that get brought to the surface because of the politics? Oh, that's a great question. I think if you look at the origins of fear, everybody lives with a certain amount of fear and anxiety. Mm -hmm. When a, a pollster takes the poll in a political campaign, they're looking for the little blips that would indicate that if this person who you like now, if you found out this little piece of information, would it make you more or less likely to vote for or against that person? When, when you begin to poke at that little blip on the radar, that little piece of information in the poll, that is when you begin to exploit people's emotions. The leader, the person who's in charge of the campaign, the person who wants to hold that political office, has to sit down with that consultant and say, wait a second, are you kidding me? Well, this crosses a line. The problem is, the only line for many politicians now is getting elected. Mm -hmm. So jumping over that line doesn't seem to prick their conscience at all. Uh, very few people have a worldview going into the campaign that says, I have an obligation not just to tell the truth, but to be responsible with the kinds of information I use because people are listening and watching. Yeah, there's there's some conversation uh, about the I, this idea of just war theory, right? In international relations, right. there's yep. justice. Uh, you have to go to war for a just cause, and if you go to war for a just cause, and that cause should also guide a certain just order in the carrying out of the war. And uh, I and others have made the argument that there there should be some form of just war theory for our political combat. Mm -hmm. I think you make that argument in your book. How should consultants go about, or candidates especially, go about this uh, to bring up, is there even a way that they can discuss issues that matter to the people, which is what our, our country is built off of, the idea of representative democracy, can they discuss these issues that people do worry about without creating this over-anxiety and over-hyping of the situation? So maybe there's a political candidate who is watching right now, and maybe they're sitting at the kitchen table with their spouse and they're saying, OK, honey, um, I'm thinking about running next year. Maybe we should hire that political consultant because I heard they know everything about politics. And so once they sit down at their kitchen table and invite the political consultant to come, they have this conversation about how are we going to win? And the consultant is really asking them, well, how far are you willing to go? How much of your beautiful homespun story do you want to exploit? And then how much are you willing to manipulate and distort the opponent? Now, right at that juncture, right at that very formative stage in a conversation with someone running a political campaign, someone in that relationship has to say, you know what, I really don't feel comfortable with this conversation. Now, overlay that if they're people of faith, mm -hmm. there should be a little ping uh, on their heart that says, uh, maybe, maybe we should stop here. If you're uh, self-identified as a Christian, you have a, a completely uh, different responsibility when it comes to how you treat your enemies. It's right there in red letters uh, how you're uh, to treat people. So I love your idea of having a philosophy of where those lines are and how far and how uh, kind of what are the rules because in most cases as long as it's legal and your lawyers say you can get away with putting that on the air and you will not be censored or stopped because of the first amendment it goes yeah that's that's a great insight jeff i, I think we forget sometimes that the legal line is not the same as the moral line um, or even even what's wise sometimes, um, it's not always the same thing as the legal line. The legal line represents the lowest common denominator in our society. Just because you don't murder someone doesn't make you candidate for person of the year, uh, kind of in that vein. Um, but Sam, 
Yeah, listen yeah. to what you just said. You used the word wise. And a uh, hundred years ago, one of the prized virtues I think we would have asked of the people that were selecting for public office is a certain amount of wisdom. Mm -hmm. We've really replaced the idea of we need wise, sober, thoughtful people with one measurement. They need to be charismatic communicators. They've got to exude a certain kind of enthusiasm for themselves, a bravado, a belief in who they are. And all these old virtues, humility and wisdom and patience and kindness, all of those things have been balanced off by the need to win. And only charismatic people, the theory goes, wins. And that's that's a, a, a hard place to come back from. I think we can, but it's, it's going to require a lot of people thinking and pushing back. Yeah. Jeff, it almost seems like what we've done, and this isn't just politically, but in, in our postmodern culture, we've replaced... Uh, these conversations about truth and ideas. And, you know, certainly as when I first got interested in politics as a young child, th there were these great debates over ideas, uh, even controversial ones, things like abortion rights yeah. and personhood sure. and taxes. And you had candidates debating ideas. And it seems now like that entire conversation has shifted from virtue just toward power. So instead of a real debate about whether or not abortion rights should be legal or at what point they should be legal or about personhood or taxes. It's now about who's going to have the majority. And, and that shift from virtue to power, from wisdom to strategy seems to be where we are now. Uh, when did we see that shift? And what do you think drove that shift? Well, I think it's, I think the kind, the way that we communicate today, the speed, the velocity of the, the amount of information communication we have has changed a lot of those rules. We're moving so quickly that at, from the beginning of this conversation that we're having now mm -hmm. to the end of this conversation, if I switch to position, we're moving so fast, some in the audience might not detect it. Mm -hmm. You would need a someone kind of an ombudsman or somebody looking over the top saying, OK, now, wait a second. Stop. Rewind the tape. Can we put those those two sentences side by side? Because I think you are inconsistent. Once you've done that, you have to present that view before something you said you believe. Guess what? Nobody subscribes to a set of principles anymore. Mm. Nobody is saying these are my fixed principles, my true north. I will never cross this line. What most people in, in political roles are saying is, where is the majority? Do I need to move towards that majority? And can I hold office holding that position? Because if, as soon as that, that position in the public changes, so does the opinion of the, of the political leader. And they no longer become leaders, by the way. I'm using that generously. They really are followers. Yeah, oh, that's a great insight. Jeff, we're going to cut the break. When we come back, I want to pick up right there and ask about the difference between leadership and, and those who are, are really followers. So don't, don't go away. We'll be right back. Face the Issues is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. You can view our in-house studio productions on demand. Or watch what's on the station right now with our 24-7 live stream. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device. Or go to our website for more information. Visit LighthouseTV.org to stay connected. There you can find out what's currently on the air and coming up. How to watch in your area on cable, satellite, broadcast, or streaming devices. Watch past programs or our live stream. Follow us on social media and learn more about the station, our hosts, and our programming. Lighthouse TV, positively different. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Jeff, thank you again for joining us. I want to pick up right where we left off. When we, when we left off, you made a comment that what happens is that these leaders, and you're using that term generously, you said, is they really stop leading and they become followers. Can you elaborate on that? What makes sure. someone a leader? Why are these people no longer leaders? 
Well, I'm going to go back in, in our history and not too long ago, you know, they just split uh, American history in half. And you say, look, about at the halfway mark in the American story, what kind of leader were we looking for? Well, you'd have people that started out perhaps in a church, uh, at least uh, a certain kind of educational environment with certain kinds of parents. Mm -hmm. And they would leave that home uh, with, a, with a sense of what they believed or what they stood for. And, and they really identified what was wrong with the culture, what was wrong with society, what was wrong with the direction of the country. And then they joined a political party that best expressed those views. And, and fast forward to today, what you essentially have are people that are saying, in my district, in my community, in my borough, my hamlet, my village, there are more Democrats than Republicans. If I want to become a power player in my community, I'm going to be a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Same thing on the converse with Republicans. So people are allowing the circumstances of what is what they think is possible for them to get power. Here's the lie that you begin to tell yourself. You say, but I won't change. I know who I am. There's nothing that can change who I am inside, even if I am in a party that doesn't agree with my worldview. That really be, shapes the idea of what it means to be a follower, not a leader. Most people that I encounter who are putting their names on ballots don't have an idea where they want to take the town, the country, uh, the world alliances that we have. They really are saying, what, what do you want? What do you want me to say? Program it in, repeat after the voter. Uh, and, and we hear that complaint from voters, this idea that uh, they're going to say whatever they need to say to get elected. How do I really know where somebody stands? But right. along those lines, Jeff, I mean, how do so these voters, they they are upset with these elected officials or politicians or candidates who do this. And yet these candidates who do this are stoking the flames of political anxiety. So how do the voters or the we the people how do they parse through that and kind of quell that political anxiety? So I don't know, Sam, if, if you have this happen to you, but I have uh, I, on my phone, I get uh, text messages that say something like, hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Or what time are you picking me up? And it's uh, it's a scam call. But those first two lines kind of get you intrigued. And the goal is for you to engage in a conversation. And eventually you're giving them your bank account information, <laughs> your routing number and all that. It's almost identical with what is happening in politics. Uh, the pollster calls in and says, hey, do you like Sam or Jeff? And you say, well, I'm kind of leaning towards Sam. I like I like Sam. I probably will vote for him. And they say, well, what if you know that that Sam uh, hasn't paid his taxes in the last 15 years. So what if you know that every word that comes out of his mouth is a lie? Are you more likely to vote for him or not? It's a well, well, I'll probably go with Jeff. And and what happens now, because it's such a sophisticated process, once you have given your information to the pollster, especially in presidential campaigns, you're being tracked mm -hmm. all the way. So you'll get another call and another touch point, and you'll see that voter going back and forth. Here's what I want people to do. I, what I, I don't want to leave people hopeless in this conversation. Well, it's just I don't even want to participate. This, see, if someone's poking themselves right now saying, see, honey, that's why I don't want to go into politics. What I want them to do is have a little more discernment, the same way that you know to end or terminate the call with the scammer who is texting you or not to give your bank account routing information when someone calls you on the phone. Be very discerning about the political information that you're getting. Say, who paid for the ad? What were they really saying? Call the campaign saying, did you really mean to say that? In most cases, the harsher things that candidates say, the candidate isn't willing to say them because they know they've crossed the line. They're using third parties to spread the bad stuff. And that's, that's just a dangerous place for us to be in politics. We can challenge that, but it will take an awful lot of people to do it. Yeah. Jeff, let me let me kind of follow up with that. There are obviously we mentioned this earlier, there are issues that bring people anxiety that are real legitimate issues. Uh, the cost of living uh, goes up. The economy isn't great. They're struggling to, to send their kids to school to put food on the table. Uh, there, there's there's concerns about, you know, the, these matters. And, and for every.
different parts of the country, different walks of life, different faiths, cultures, so forth. They have different concerns. These are all legitimate. Uh, they look to the government for redress of a lot of these issues. Yeah. And you have these candidates who speak to this. At what point does it go from yeah. it's it's a legitimate concern to now this is something that's been overhyped, is causing a lot of anxiety? Like, how do you, what do you tell a voter that says, okay, I'm going to, to push back on some of this rhetoric, but I'm still concerned about whether or not I can put gas in my car to go to work. First of all, one of the things that I think voters have to guard themselves against is this idea that the issue has to be solved at the state government mm -hmm. or the federal government, meaning um, we're talking about gas lines or inflation there, there's, of the bridge, the, if the bridge collapses, you know, what is the immediate response? Is that the responsibility of the ship uh, that crashed into the bridge? Is it a responsibility of the city where the bridge collapsed? Or is it all the responsibility of the government in Washington? What happens is when you have a tragedy like that and an interruption in a normal day, all of the uh, politicians are running to the cameras saying, I'll fix it. I'll be the one to fix it. Here's what has to happen. At some point, if that is not the responsibility of a state or a federal or a local government or the shipping company, someone has to say, in my way of thinking, this is the person who is responsible for it. You actually don't have anything to do with this conversation. We don't know enough about what we believe to know who is responsible. You know, we can say we're opposed to public welfare programs that people should work. But then you say, well, what about somebody who is disabled? Yeah, but still, that should be the church or the family's responsibility. You say, but what about if this was a genetic mm -hmm. uh, situation? They weren't responsible. What if they have no parents? Well, see, we don't know, right? Every issue has these lines. We're just all a little confused. So we're listening to voices and personalities instead of reading books, reading newspapers, thinking and arguing with ourselves about what we believe. We've got to stay off social media, not dive straight into the conversation before we know what we really think. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's fantastic advice. Gar asking these good questions, digging into the details, understanding the nuance of that. Um, Jeff, let me let me ask this. Uh, th this has gone beyond politics. This has affected relationships. It's affected families. It's affected uh, church communities. I, I I don't know if you've experienced this. I've experienced this, where I will go to church and an interview that I've done. The week earlier, somebody heard it on air, somebody saw it in, in Newsweek or wherever, and suddenly somebody who was friendly to me before in church now has these reservations or is upset or is angry, is going to accost me in church about it. It's cost, uh, I know a lot of people in our, in our work, they can't be part of church small groups and so forth. They have issues with their own family, uh, Thanksgiving dinners that stop being, that, that family stop coming together for. What do you say to families and individuals who are at that stage uh, and, and that this is all part of that political anxiety? Well, first, I know something about every one of our viewers right now, and that is that every person who is viewing has a political view that was probably shaped by their personal experience. For as much as we want to say that I believe what I believe because of because I read the book, I read the studies, I know the science, we are really creatures of the churches we go to, the people that we hang out with. Our parents have a lot of a lot of influence. Uh, the, the hard things, the difficult things that have happened to us in life uh, and how we respond to that, that shapes our political views and how we. So here's what I, I'd love for people to do before you dismiss somebody and say, oh, I can you believe they have that person sign up in their yard? Or can you believe that they told me that they're they're not with us on House Bill? particular number. They wouldn't sign my petition. And that's the end of the conversation. What we really have to do is first, I say this all the time, know the story first. Mm. Know why they believe what they believe. Because once you solve that riddle, you'll find that even though that Democrat or that Republican disagrees with you, you'll end up explaining to your husband or wife or your friend, let me tell you why they think that way. Do you know what happened to them? Do you know why there's such an advocate for this kind of program or bill? Don't talk to them about big government or, or small government or abortion or trans rights issue. Don't. You know what happened to them? And then suddenly a, a person who was a political issue mm -hmm. is a person 
we can love people. <laughs> we can we can treat people with a whole lot of respect, but it really begins at that level. If you've never, if you don't know these people and you have no interaction with them at all, and you're in traffic and you see their bumper sticker, you see the hair that you don't like their hairstyle, or they drive a hybrid and you drive a big <laughs> F-150, you know, you immediately have friction and you immediately have to make a decision. So my recommendations are just imagine the story, mm. think through before you get mad at them and, and treat them as a, a political billboard, imagine uh, the history, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years that led up to the moment that your car drove next to their car and they honked at you or they flipped you the bird, whatever that is, we can have a whole lot of grace for people when we imagine what their stories are. Wow, I think that's fantastic advice. You know, we all talk about peeling the Washington's better angels. Sometimes we have to peel to our own. Um, Jeff, thank you again for that insight. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. You can view our in-house studio productions on demand. Or watch what's on the station right now with our 24-7 live stream. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device. Or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Lighthouse TV. Positively different. Face the Issues is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Jeff, thank you again for joining us. I want to close out, and you made this point earlier about getting to know the person beyond the talking points. That's why we close every program by putting aside the content we just discussed and really just getting to know the guest. You've been a elected official, you've been a candidate, you've been a statewide candidate, you're married to an elected official. Give us that insight from behind, like instead of from as a voting a voter, as actually the person who is the elected official. Uh, I imagine all of this is very real in a different way. What is what is it that voters need to see about the people that are on the ballot that they might not? Well, it's the ordinariness of the people who you elect. From the president on down, uh, they live very, very ordinary lives. Uh, whenever I get a chance to talk to somebody who knows somebody famous, a general, a president, uh, a news anchor, I'm always... Uh, asking questions about what are they really like? What do they drive? How do they drive? What do they eat? And what I find out is that the ordinariness of all of us is what makes us pretty special. All of us uniquely different. Um, my wife and I, Rebecca and I played this game about uh, who would we like to have at our dinner table? You know, of all people in history, boy, I'd like to have that person there and this person there. And it's a pretty rowdy collection of people. And uh, I hope one day we'll be able to assemble that, that table. But I think that is fantastic advice. Uh, Jeff, you you would always be welcome at my table. I think that would always be a fantastic continuation of this conversation. And again, my thanks to Jeff Coleman for joining us. And my thanks to each of you for tuning in as well. We hope that you'll join us again right back here next week. Until then, my name is Sam Chen. On behalf of all of us here at Face the Issues, thank you and good night.